afternoon, race fans, and welcome to the 15th running of the Sailor Sea Sea Snail Sweepstakes. We've got a talented bunch of 18-month-old Pinto Abalone taking the field. The odds-on favorite wearing the green and red shell is Mighty Mollusk, who's finished in the money his last three times out. Also wearing green and red is Escar Gogo, running at 9 to 5 at post time. At even money is Shell Dorado, the Abyssal Missile. And the long shot today at 40 to 1 is Abalone. The gastropods are at the gate. <laughs> Mighty Mollusk jumps to the front of the pack and takes the early lead with Sheldorado close behind. Escargogo third and trailing the field is Abalone. On the far stretch, Mighty Mollusk is driving hard as Sheldorado begins to fade. And as the field rounds the last turn, it's Mighty Mollusk and Escargogo battling it out, followed by Sheldorado and Abalone. And the Pitos are into the stretch. Here comes Abalone. He's off the bridle and making a move on the outside. It's Mighty Mollusk, Escargogo, and Abalone. Now Abalone charges into their place. They're neck and neck. Mighty Mollusk and Abalone. Abalone and Mighty Mollusk. It's down to the wire end. It's Abalone by two and a half tentacles. This gorgeous gastropod is a pinto abalone. It's an endangered sea snail. And we're here today with a whole group of people working to recover this species. We're just horsing around about the underwater Whoa. snail racing. But these pintos really ah. are thoroughbreds. They're the only species of abalone native to the Salish Sea. And their amazing story makes them our favorite seashelled critter. Like horses, abalone are plant eaters. But that's where the similarities stop led by their cephalic or head tentacles and curious little alien eyes at the tips of two waving stalks. The main body of the pinto abalone sprouts hundreds of shorter epipodial tentacles. Add the hard shell on top and an abalone looks like a koosh ball wearing a bike helmet. All these tentacles are sensory organs, helping the pinto navigate her rocky world by touch, taste, and smell. What she's sniffing and feeling around for a marine algae, from microscopic diatoms to the largest blades of kelp. When the abalone finds something appetizing, she feeds on it by using a bizarre zipper-like structure called a radula. This muscular membrane is armed with hundreds of tiny, endlessly replaced teeth. The radula's remarkable versatility allows abalone to scrape slime off solid surfaces, chew on rock-hard encrusting algae, and surgically slice into thick kelp. We're pretty happy abalone don't grow 20 feet long and like to unzip scuba divers. The name Pinto comes from the species' mottled skin coloration, not their speed. But abalone actually do have some giddy up. When they need to escape an enemy or chase down a piece of drift kelp, abalone flex their powerful undulating foot and do the gastropod version of galloping. But they are still snails. And despite their relative quickness, they're easy pickings for certain determined predators like sea otters and especially humans. Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest have treasured abalone for thousands of years, both for their nutritional and cultural value. The iridescent inside of the shell, called mother of pearl or nacre, is produced as the abalone secretes layer upon layer of aragonite. This complex calcium carbonate lamination reflects visible light like an opal, making stunning inlays for ceremonial masks and spiritual talismans. Puget Sound pintos never attracted a commercial fishery, but back in the day, recreational scuba divers often filled their goodie bags with them. Up in BC, where pintos are called northern abalone, authorities nabbed a trio of rustlers red-handed with 11,000 of them in the bed of a pickup. By the late 1980s, overfishing and poaching caused Salish Sea populations to crater. Resource managers believed that numbers would quickly bounce back, but they didn't. So how could a species whose large females can produce millions of eggs every year fail to recover when we stop taking them? It turns out we'd already drained their dating pool so low that pintos couldn't find mates. Abalone are broadcast spawners. That means that rather than cuddling up one-on-one, -on -one, they respond to environmental cues that tell them the timing is right for a reproductive roundup. 
It's just like how single people respond to a Friday night happy hour. Instead of piling onto the dance floor, pintos climb onto rocks, where they broadcast their sperm and eggs through the holes in their shells. Abalone don't have to get close enough to tickle each other's tentacles, but in order to have any chance of fertilization, they need to be within about three square meters, the equivalent of a queen-size bed. But when researchers surveyed places in the San Juan Islands, they found that densities were 100 times lower than what was needed to successfully reproduce, and pinto abalone had to be declared endangered. On the Washington side of the Salish Sea, they're now considered functionally extinct, meaning that pintos are not reproducing enough to naturally sustain their population. The few abs that remain are abalone. Biologists even attempted a mollusk matchmaking service, where divers relocated adult pintos closer together. We're not sure if they resented the forced marriages or not, but for whatever reason, this didn't work. The only chance to resurrect our local abalone comes down to conservation aquaculture, mating wild born pintos in tanks and releasing the young into the sea. This is the type of captive breeding program that saved the California condor and Brazilian golden lion tamarind. It's one of the ecologists' last resorts, but algae grazers like abalone are ecosystem engineers, important links in keeping the Salish Sea's critical kelp force healthy. So they're worth the effort. The Sea Doc Society got involved early, mapping abalone habitat, funding genetic research, and studying the growth and survival of juvenile pintos. If the effort was going to be successful, it had to be grounded in serious science. Now, every year, scuba diving biologists set out to wrangle healthy adult abalone. But even in ideal pinto habitat, there are so few left that just finding one is difficult. Adding to the challenge, an abalone's camouflage of encrusting pink coral and algae is so effective that it takes an expert eye to spot them, even when they're sitting right in front of you. Hello, you gorgeous gastropod. She's a beauty. Let's call her Abigail. Like many marine egg layers, the larger the females grow, the more productive they become. A female Abigail size could generate 4 million eggs every year for the program. But these scientists don't count their pintos before they're hatched. First, they need to scour the area to make sure there are no other abalone that might breed naturally with this one. Nope, Abby's a bachelorette. During mating season, she'll polish her mother of pearl, get an epipodial pedicure, and curl her tentacles, ready for a big night out. But it's wasted effort. The club is dead. The only chance for Abigail to pass on her genes is to join the recovery program. She doesn't know this, of course, so the challenge now is convincing her to come with us. Abby's grip is so strong that you couldn't pull her off that rock without hurting her. And abalone's best defense against most predators is to retract their eyes and tentacles and hunker down under their shell. But that defense doesn't work against one particular kind of hunter that uses patience, thousands of hydraulically powered sucker pods, and in some species, a freaky stomach that oozes out of its body to digest mollusks inside of their own shells. Carnivorous sea stars scare the shell out of abalone. So during abalone roundups, scientists enlist their help to collect breeders without the risk of injuring them. Because our species evolved to recognize this danger, as soon as Abby senses the sea star, she rears up and stampedes, trying to outrun it. <laughs> of course, this all happens at a snail's pace. Once she releases suction and starts to move, the diver can simply pick her up. Puget Sound Restoration Fund's Abalone Program Director Josh Bauma and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Biologist Katie Sewell do a quick examination to confirm Abby's sex and general health. She looks great, and so she's on her way to join a select stable of pinto abalone destined to repopulate their species in the Salish Sea. Scientists at the NOAA Chu Center for Shellfish Research and Restoration also move at a snail's pace, at least when it comes to how they've painstakingly designed this recovery project. Josh introduces us to the critters under his care in the pinto barn. Larger tanks hold the breeding adults, while the little labs share baby pools with their brothers and sisters. Those shells are amazing. It'd be easier to breed captive raised abalone generation after generation, but that would likely result in weaker animals that didn't survive well in the open sea. All the young born here meant for release 
have wild parents collected just like Abigail. This ensures that they maintain the genetic diversity needed to keep abalone resilient in the face of our changing climate. So far, the program has produced a remarkable 179 genetically distinct families of pinto abalone. The pinto adults are fed only the finest cuts of fresh kelp presented a natural. Staff see to all their abalone needs. They want to keep their guests contented and comfortable enough to breed. Now, have you ever seen an abalone face? You're looking at one right now. These are the eye stalks right here, and these are the cephalic tentacles, and he's just gonna pick himself up and you're gonna see his mouth right there. Look quickly, he's smiling. <laughs> Once abalone eggs hatch, the larvae are self-sufficient for about a week. After that, these tiny little zipper mouths are hungry and need to be fed. This is where marine biologist meets mad scientist. It's alive! Welcome to the laboratory of Dr. Planktonstein. It's taken years of experiments to perfect these recipes that nourish baby pinto abalone so they grow into vigorous youngsters. Once they reach a minimum of five millimeters long, the size of a pencil eraser, young abs are ready for the outplant program. This is the big day for those thousands of baby abalone that we met back at the hatchery. After all that effort being nurtured from microscopic larvae, now it's time to kick them out of the hatchery and into the dating pool of the Big Emerald Sea. So far, the recovery program has released 50,000 healthy juvenile pintos. The Washington State Legislature recently boosted funding for the effort. Back in there. Baby abalone born at the Chu Center are now also being raised at the Seattle Aquarium and Port Townsend Marine Science Center. The goal is to jumpstart a self-sustaining population so there'll be no more lonely abalone in the Salish Sea. Katie and biologist Taylor Frierson swim down with the babies on board their PVC playpens. They measure out a grid and then pick spots to place the modules. They use rocks to anchor and camouflage the tubes. This is ideal abalone habitat, rocky and well lit, with lots of encrusting coral and algae and various species of kelp for the pentos to feed on. And finally, it's time. The screens are removed and, and they're off. Well, <laughs> they're off on abalone time. <laughs> These little jewels will mature in two to three years. With any luck, they'll then have another 30 or so years to mate with their dating pools and dance cards refilled by this wonderful project. Club Abalone will be jumping. Remember those people from the left? You can help save the Sailor Seas Pinto Abalone. Hey, that's us! Shh! But I'm trying to tell them about our website. Go to cdocsociety.org forward slash abalone hyphen restoration. You forgot the www. They don't need that. Only smart people watch this show. Ah, okay. Hey, I want to see it. Can I borrow your shell phone? What's up, CDOC? Radula, I want to bite your kelp. <laughs> <laughs>